anecdote uh, how I ended up doing this project with my colleague, Dr. Kubiak. I work in Russia, China. I've done that stuff for a long time. That's a lot of years learning Russian Chinese. I'm going to deal with this as long as I possibly can. Every project I can, can come on that deals with this, I'm going to work on that. And I did IR theory stuff in grad school, but not having really kept up the literature. Coming back to my uh, place of employment, talked to my colleague, Dr. Kubiak. We began going back and forth a few months ago. I was studying Russian Chinese strategic cooperation, interaction, military sales, and trying to figure out how, how would you know when the regime would kind of sell itself out in terms of self security? And what would neoliberal institutionalism say about that? What would realism say about that? And helping me use IR theory to understand that. And we finally saw the call for papers. Chuck Farrell sent us and said, hey, you see this conference coming up. <coughs> Jeff, this is it. We need to kind of put our heads together and look at the theoretical dimension to this, the theory of our theory can have insight into what's going on between Russia and China at the strategic level, and at the same point, uh, this case study can inform theory. So that's the, the genesis of why we're here. I think it's clear to everyone in the room here that since 1992, China and Russia have begun to move closer together. In the wake of the Kenneman incident of 1989, you had a arms embargo by the U.S. And by Europe against China, and China looked for arms, arms procurement from the outside world, and Russia was more than happy to oblige. It was one of its components of its industrial production that did not plummet drastically as other parts did, and that became the basis for their, their initial cooperation. Uh, if you jump through to today, you'll see that recent pronouncements are discussing an even closer degree of cooperation, and we have bantered about everything from uh, partnership all the way through alliance with a question mark. How far will this go? Uh, if there is an emerging strategic alliance, we need to identify it. There are significant security implications for the United States, for the United States forces and our allies, based on the Russia-China relationship. How do we know how far this will go? How do we know uh, if they will end up developing an alliance? Will the current trajectory persist? These are all questions that wait for strategic considerations. Again, I don't think this audience, any of this stuff is new. Uh, we just decided we wanted to kind of run it over very quickly, talk about some of the milestones that occurred in Russian Chinese cooperation, uh, which goes back to 1992 when Yeltsin visits China, where they sign a non-aggression pact and begin some military technical cooperation. So, strategic, maybe not so much. There's some interaction, but uh, it's not at the expense of any third party state. 93, signed a five year defense cooperation agreement. Jump ahead, 96, 97, Yeltsin Johnson in, you can discuss a constructive partnership. Now you see the evolution of the relationship to uh, actually have this kind of conference and partnership, what that implies. Uh, Evgeny Primakov, when he became foreign minister, began to encourage a Russo Chinese <coughs> strategic partnership. So we go up from uh, constructive to strategic. And I have argued in a book I have coming out with Nicholas Bozdev that the NATO operation in Kosovo in March 1999 had a very serious effect on both Chinese and Russian thinking of the U.S., of the international system. Uh, and there's evidence of that. Yeltsin goes to Beijing in December of 99, so in the wake of this, and gets a little drunk and starts screaming and bantering about <coughs> Russia being a nuclear power. People don't really pick up on this, but the point is, they're saying they're not Serbia, that you can't have a territorial dispute and come, like they have in Chechnya, because there were a new war in Chechnya in the fall of 99, and you can't have NATO come in and just kick it around and decide what's going to do. Uh, and you, you see this, I think, as a pretty important event in pushing Russia and China closer. And we see that especially as Putin consolidates his power and it becomes one of his big agenda items. Again, IR theory is going to have to tell us why he's doing it, what he's doing, and how it relates to other elite and other uh, points of decision making within the country. <clears throat> but just to continue here, uh, 2001, 2002, you see other treaties signed. Uh, you see the expansion of trade that was discussed before. Uh, 2008, 55 billion in bilateral trade, reaching 90 billion. Uh, last year, 
the projections, 100 billion by 2015, and there are other guys here who are in the earlier panel that can discuss whether or not these are feasible. But these are put out there as their, their ideal state as some objective down the road. 200 billion by 2020. But what we're going to do now is step back from that. Oh, I'm in the wrong way. Oh, we're going to step back. I didn't mean to step back. Uh, not just the volume of trade, but let's look at the composition. Let's look at arms sales. They are a component of it, sometimes a big boost to it. And in particular, what we've been looking at is the types of weapons. Selling a Kalashnikov and selling, you know, selling a million dollars with a Kalashnikov is one thing. Selling uh, Sukhoi 35s is a very, very different thing. So it's not just about the numbers of trade. It's not just about the, the raw numbers of arms sales. It's the weapon systems. How advanced are those weapon systems? Uh, that becomes an important strategic calculation. Uh, it's kind of the focus of, of how we're going to operationalize our terms and then attempt to test the IR theory side of the house. Again, this is all, I don't, I don't think much news to you here. Uh, China becoming Russia's biggest defense customer, taking up to 40% of all weapons sold between 92 and 2007. Uh, and then things become a little more difficult. When you move away from the lower quality air airframes, lower quality data subsystems, and your cloth to call to start moving to other types of technology, the Russians became reticent. They were not exactly sure how far to take this. And I don't know how many of you have been following this, but the recent deal with the uh, <coughs> sale of the four body class submarines and the uh, Sukhoi 35s, the Chinese press announced it immediately, great deal signed. On the Russian side, there was a lot of pushback. Uh, I don't know if, you, if many of you followed that, but that's an interesting dimension because it seems that Putin can't just announce this. And one of the big things we follow, Pat, and one of the analysts there named Vasily Kachin came out and said, no, this is it's actually a mistake. That's not what happened. It's overblown. So what we're getting at here is an elite debate over the nature of Russo-Chinese strategic cooperation. And that's how we're going to go down to a lower level of analysis to get at individual groups and decision makers and intellectual entrepreneurs within the society to look for the impact that will have on the trajectory. Russo Chinese cooperation. So again, this is a strategic issue. It's as strategic as it gets. It's not the same as Kalashnikov. This is going to have an impact on Russia's security. And the weapons being sold to China will have an impact on our posture in the Pacific. <coughs> again, I'm sure you've seen some of these quotes of General Wang Haiyun coming out saying the time's right for United Front. Or quasi alliance. So you see the evolution of this language from 92 to today, uh, President Xi Jinping uh, I, pointing to Russo Chinese cooperation as one of the most important priorities for his leadership. So, what we're going to do now is turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kubiak, because it's IR theory that can provide us insight into the strategic calculations made by states and going inside the state of individual actors. Right, and then I'll come back at the end. And, you're to say, see the gesture. I think I think Dr. Marsh is overselling my portion here. Don't be confused. <laughs> he is the mission, and I, as the military would say, I'm just a force multiplier. I, I'm here to bring uh, a little color, I guess, to uh, to the research project. Um, so, increasingly, this the relationship between Russia and China looks more and more like balance. It looks more and more like what a uh, international relations realist uh, at the structural level would say is is, uh, is balancing. They've had to. Most of the international, realist, uh, international relations realists have had to add other uh, variables, intervening variables, to explain it. You have to call it soft balancing because it's not really hard balancing as, as, as uh, they're big. Um, they've had to uh, state behavior uh, and at the macro level within the state uh, at the generation of grand strategy. So as I sort of meant, uh, mentioned this morning at Bible I think like, uh, Brad mentioned it, uh, we, we have to open the box. We, in order to understand state behavior, even, even the neo-realists, the, the classical, or the, I'm sorry, the neo-realists, the structural realists, uh, understand that the crucial variables that determine state behavior actually reside inside the box. One of those being threat perception for even those uh, uh, 
very classic neorealist as a, as a Stephen Wall. Uh, the neoclassical realists add a, an entire litany of other variables, intervening variables, that shape state behavior in the international system. Um, state coherence, elite consensus, societal coherence, strategic culture, all these things impact how a state perceives its threats uh, and how it behaves with, uh, with regards to other actors in the international system. Which we see, but we don't think the cinephile can't is as powerful or monolithic as this portends for it to be. Uh, Marlene Morel came out with a piece not too long ago in the same volume with Stephen Blank, where uh, she did a very good job. She went down with the think tanks, different policy positions being put forward in journals and newspapers. Uh, and, and I love her dearly, she's a good friend, but it's not systematic. It's not as systematic as what we're going for. We want something more systematic and comprehensive. Uh, than what she's done, and we're going to use hers as a launching point. Uh, That's what I mean by black specificity. Uh, Stephen Blank, uh, he's, he's a great addition in that volume as well, talking about the nature of that, that relationship, talking about the suspicion, suspicion, the rivalry that's intrinsic in there, and uh, he quotes from our esteemed colleague on the back row, Jacob Kim, where he says, China as Russia's unnamed strategic threat. And so this is there, and as I finished my book two books ago, uh, where I looked at the elite narratives on issues of political and economic reform in Russia and China. Uh, it was very clear to me that there's differences of opinion, and that's what we're trying to get at here, about an issue of foreign policy and Russia's alignment with China or balancing with China. What are these elite narratives? And, and then if, can we see if some are on the rise or some are um, diminishing? So our approach to this, and let me kind of interject here, uh, we applied for a grant to conduct field work in Russia on this to meet with the different think tanks get some other primary source materials and so forth. Uh, DOD does not want to pay for us to, uh, to do this. So, of course, we need outside uh, grant to do that. Uh, and we're both coming off of books. So having written these books, we're looking at kind of a new research program to get involved in. And so this is kind of the preliminary stage for us. So we do appreciate your feedback. Uh, so again, we, our approach is we're going to look at Sino-Russian relations alone, not just opposed to Westernizers or, or in some other way, but focus specifically on this relationship and look at the myriad possibilities that exist in terms of Russian attitudes towards uh, China. Uh, they you know, look at the influence of relevant groups, so groups like CAST, uh, the military, other think tanks, Carnegie, you know, Center, for instance. And